this uh, class, the adult room here, we're going to be starting a, a series today that will go through the end of December, the Lord willing. Uh, there'll be a couple of lessons on biblical manhood, womanhood, and all this is sort of geared uh, toward uh, family dynamics. Uh, there'll be uh, three lessons uh, in the first of December on uh, parenting and grandparenting. I don't know that I've ever heard a lesson on grandparenting, uh, but we're going to have that because we do have a number of grandparents in the church, and we obviously have a number of parents. And this is one of the things that's provoking this is because we have a, a kind of a new generation of parents. Uh, and, I, you know, we've been through various studies of parenting in the past, but you're going to hear a different voice. Uh, Brother Stewart's going to be bringing those lessons. And then the final lesson in December, uh, I will likely uh, have all of everyone in here, and I'm going to speak to the children. Uh, children, obey your parents. And so it's going to be a, a lesson to the children in here with all of us together. That's kind of the plan, so that you know. All right? All right. Uh, oh, Brother Aaron, I started to say Brother Stewart. That would have uh, been a shocker, right? Good morning. Well, I've been assigned to teach on the subject of biblical manhood and womanhood. Not exactly a topic that I of my own accord would choose to talk about, but it is an important topic that we should all not only know, but seek to implement in our lives the knowledge of what a, a biblical man is a, and what is a biblical woman. And that's a good, uh, well, a good question to start with in this, this lesson, or this teaching is, what does it mean to be a, a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What are the similarities between each? What are the differences, the distinctions between a man and a woman? What are the roles of men in society? What are the roles of women? What are the roles of men and women in the family? What constitutes a biblical marriage and why? These are, these are good questions to ask, to ask ourselves and to know the answer to. I mean, these are actually not just good, these are essential. We, we need to know the answer to these questions. If an unbeliever or even our children asks us one of these questions, do we know how to give a biblical response? Can we go to a passage of scripture? What is a man? Well, let's go to this passage and this passage. Can we answer these questions biblically? This topic is of the utmost importance for us today as we live in a postmodern, post-Christian, pagan culture that is bent in undoing God's design, God's created order. As Christians, we are constantly bombarded by the persistent attacks of groups like radical feminism, ideas such as gender ideology, the distortion, the confusion, the, the perversion of marriage, the ever-increasing influence of an encouragement to or toward sexual perversion, the, the sexual confusion that's prevalent now even among our own children. The, the primary targets and the unfortunate casualties of these kinds of attacks are our children, the next generation. And so we have a dire, we have an urgent, we have a pressing need to arm, to equip ourselves with the Word of God. And not only to combat the falsehoods all around us, but also to instruct our children, to teach them the Word of God regarding manhood, regarding womanhood. And so we must begin with Scripture. We have to start with the Scripture as our foundation. And what I want to share is a basic, a broad general teaching about manhood and womanhood 
just lay some foundations. I'm sure at the very least most of us will know these things. It's good to have a reminder of these things. So I, I want to begin or I want to uh, teach by means of two very simple questions, two foundational questions. How are men and women alike and how are men and women different? What does the Bible say about this? So we'll begin with the first question. How and are men and women alike? And if we want to answer that question in the first place, we need to go, if we're going to start uh, chronologically in Scripture, well, it's Genesis chapter 1. So please ac accompany me to Genesis 1. Genesis 1.26. This is known as the creation mandate or the dominion mandate. But prior to that, before that, we see this description in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here we find a description of, of man's nature, of man's task, of man's commission man is made his created in the image of God so what does it mean to be made in the image of God well basically I mean we could spend a lot of time on this we're not going to but basically man reflects God and he reflects God ontologically that is in his being and functionally namely in his function in the world in his role in the world. Man reflects God in his being, in his nature, in his essence, and in regards to his function. Man reflects God in his nature, that is, he is a moral being, he is a rational being, he utilizes his faculties of reason, he is a relational being, made to be in relationship, as we'll see. Man is self-aware, Man exercises creativity. All these types of things distinguish him from the rest of the creatures, from the animals. Not to mention man is a spiritual being with a spirit. So in all these ways, we could say man reflects God in his being. And man reflects God in his function, as we read here, he is created to exercise dominion over every creature on the earth thus reflecting God's rule. God is the one who exercises dominion over everything, and man reflects this in his life, in his function in society and in the world. But I, what, what I want to bring your attention here to is that mankind, both male and female, are described as created in the image of God. Both reflect God in these two ways ontologically and functionally. In fact, what we see in the, here and in the next chapter is that both together most fully reflect the image of God. So what we see here is that they're both of equal importance and value, man and woman. One is not superior to the other. One is not of a superior nature, as some have taught, that man is somehow superior to women they're, they're not of a, even of a different nature. Men and women have the same human nature. They're both made in the image of God. They, they're both, they both bear the image of God. So we don't see a hierarchy here. As regards to their intrinsic worth as creatures that bear God's image, there is no distinction. So this means, and this, is, this has massive implications, 
This means that whatever the Bible has to say about the distinction between the roles of men and women, about the headship of men, about the authority, the, the authority or, or leadership of men, or about the submission of women, whatever the Bible has to say about these topics, it, it is nowhere implied in Scripture that man is somehow superior to women. One sex is not superior to the other. They're equal in nature, they're equal in importance, they're equal in worth. And this equality, in fact, is only reinforced and even heightened under the New Covenant. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, beginning with verse 28. It says here, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Neither Jew, Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. In Christ we are one. And we must understand this. If we are to talk about the roles of men and women, we must first understand this fact. We are equal in nature, and not only in nature, in Christ, we are equal. Now, let, let me just for a moment share what this verse does not mean, what it is not talking about. This verse is not denying that there is a distinction in roles. This verse is not denying that God has commanded men to do certain things and women to do certain things and there are some things that men can do and women cannot do. There are some things that women can do and men cannot do. This verse is not, the, this passage is not denying that reality. What it's saying is that in Christ we are one. Uh, one is not more important than the other. We're equal heirs of the promise of salvation, all the privileges of salvation are ours, whether we are men or women. We are equal heirs. One is not better than the other. One is not more privileged than the other of salvation. All the blessings in Christ. But at the same time, we see here that, that there remains still a, a certain distinction, right? If, if, if you are a Jew and the Lord saves you, well, you can't say, well, now I'm a Greek. Physically, in the flesh, right? No, you, you still remain a Jew, right? Even though you're saved, you're physically, I'm talking about physically, a Jew, right? If you're a Greek, you're still physically a Greek. You don't change. If you're a slave and you're saved, well, that doesn't mean you, you necessarily stop being a slave, right? You're not going to go to your master if you're living in those times, you know. Well, master, I, I got saved and therefore I'm free, therefore I can leave. No, that doesn't change. Your role in society doesn't necessarily change because you are saved. But the fact of, of your privilege in Christ changes. You, you, you receive all these blessings equally. All the people of God. So, men and women, how are they alike? Well, we are equal in nature and we are equal under Christ, in Christ, under the new covenant in privilege. We have equal privilege. So this brings us to the second question. And we're going to spend the majority of our time on the second question. We're not going to finish today with the second question. We're just merely going to begin, merely going to scratch the surface of the answer to the second question. How are men and women different? How has God designed us to be different? The first thing we must realize is that what, in whatever way men and women are different, they've been designed to complement one another. We complement one another. And everything I'm going to share about the differences between men and women have to do with this, with, with, with complementation. 
In fact, as I mentioned, both men and women together, together most fully represent and reflect the image of God. We see this especially in Genesis chapter 2. Let's go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2 verse 18, starting there. It says here, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. It's very interesting. In Genesis chapter 1, God makes the heavens and the earth. God separates the light from the darkness. God divides the waters from the land. He makes the plant plants. He makes day and night. He creates every sea creature. He makes all the beasts and creeping things of the earth. And God repeatedly says in Genesis 1, And God saw that it was good. 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 And chapter 1 ends with the following. Then God saw everything that he, has, he had made, and indeed it was very good. All creation is very good. But we get to the next chapter and we zoom in on the story of man, on the creation of man, and we see that there's something that's not good. It is not good for man to be alone. Man has been created as an image bearer. He bears the image of God. He reflects God. And he is thus a relational creature. He is a relational being. God is relational. We see the, the relationship of the persons in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They eternally enjoy intimate fellowship one with another. And man was created to reflect that. He is a relational being, and thus he needs companionship. He was not made to be alone. You know, as a parenthesis, I just want to say real quick, there are people who profess to be Christians who say, well, I don't need the church. I can worship God on my own. I can worship God by myself. I even... Uh, well, I, uh, in an internet forum many, many years ago, someone was asking about uh, the Lord's Supper. Some guy wanted to take the Lord's Supper by himself. <laughs> and it just, I remember it started a whole debate, and, and it was some Christian website. Because people were trying to tell him, well, the Lord's Supper, you know, you can't take it by yourself. It's, you know, and he, he wouldn't have any of that. He, he just wanted to take the Lord's Supper by himself. He, he missed the entire meaning of the Lord's Supper. <laughs> we have not been made to be alone. We have been made to be with others in the community of God's covenant people. That's God's design from the beginning. And so we see Adam is a relational being. He needs, he needs companionship. It is not good for him to be alone. And so in verse 19 it says, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper, helper comparable to him. So God brings all the animals to Adam, or at least a good amount of animals to Adam. Adam names them. But you see what's going on in the text? We see a contrast here. He's naming the animals. And as he's naming the animals, he undoubtedly realizes what? Well, here is a, this is the, the feline type of animal. I, I don't know what names he would have given each animal. Obviously not the same as the names, the classification system that we have today. But he's naming these animals and he realizes, well, there's male and female, male and female, male and female. So then he's like, well, what about me? Where's my companion? God does this. 
Apparently, God does this on purpose so that he would realize that. There was no helper comparable to him, suitable to him. He needs a helper. This term helper denotes one who supplies strength in an area that is lacking. Counterpart. Corresponding to him. And what does God do? We see verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall be become one flesh. God puts Adam into a deep sleep. As, as Ray Comfort once said, it never says that Adam came out of that sleep. That, that's how men are, right? <laughs> that was tongue in cheek. Men are often oblivious to what's going on. They need a, that's why they need a, a helpmate, right? To, to help them. So God makes man, puts him into, into a deep sleep, takes Adam's rib, makes Eve from his rib. She was created from man. In verse 22, it says, this, this word made here in verse 22, he made into a woman, is not the, it is, not the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 1 when it says that God made man. This word made means built and is used in the Bible in reference to architecture. So what it's, what, what it's telling us here is that woman was uniquely and intricately designed. She was formed. She was built. She was crafted to complement man. She was built from man to help him. And she's a part of man. That's why she's called woman. The Hebrew word, or one of the Hebrew words for man is ish. And the word for woman is isha. So she, she's, she belongs to man. She's a part of man. And, you know, when they are united in marriage, there is a reunion, so to speak. The woman taken from man is now joined with man. And, and, and there is a fit right there. And when they're joined together in holy matrimony, they are described as becoming one flesh. And this word for one here is echad in the Hebrew. And this word describes a compound unity, a united or a unified oneness. And this is the very same word used in the Shema of Israel in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Many would argue, and I would agree with them, that the reference to God being one is a reference to his unified oneness. It's not a coincidence that the term Elohim could be taken in the plural. The Lord, Yahweh, our Elohim, our God, is one, is a compound unity. I believe that is one of the many little hints in the Old Testament that we get to the plurality of persons in the Godhead, the Trinity. And so man and woman by themselves are the image of God, but when they come together in marriage, when they are one in marriage, they reflect the oneness of the Trinity, the unified oneness of the Trinity. So, men and women are different. How are they different? Well, they, there are many ways in there in, in which they are different. We're, we'll get into that. But for now, I just want to say they are different in ways that complement one another. That's very important that, that we know that. We, we complement each other. 
And the image of God is most fully represented, shown, reflected when a man and woman are united in holy matrimony. They are one. So that should end some of the thoughts that men have against their wives or wives have against their husbands. Sometimes when they get into an argument, they, well, I don't need you, I don't need you. Well, yes, you do. You need one another because you complement one another. Men need their wives. Wives need their husbands. So if we ever have a thought like that, we, we should put it to death because it is completely, totally against God's design and God's purpose for marriage. Your wife compliments you. Your husband compliments you. That doesn't mean there is a perfect compliment, a perfect fit, because we live in a fallen world, right? And God, in His providence, will allow our spouses to have certain weaknesses that are kind of similar to our weaknesses sometimes. Not all the time. In, in many ways, our spouses compliment us, but in some ways they don't. And God has designed it that way. He has allowed in, in this fallen world for it to be like that. Why? So that we may seek His help. So that we may be conformed to the image of Christ. Sometimes we want our spouse to have a certain strength because we have a certain weakness that we want that strength to complement, but they don't. They don't have that strength. They have a similar weakness to us. And we, we, we can be tempted to ask, why, Lord, why is it like this? I wish my wife or I wish my husband weren't like this in this area. But God has done it that way, so you would seek the Lord, and so you would be conformed to the image of Christ, so that you would be more like Him. And so men and women complement one another. They, they are different, they are distinct in many ways, and they are distinct in ways that complement one another. That's what I want us to know, that's what I want us to learn right now and be reminded of right now. But I want to end with the following. I think it's very important to also mention the following. We also need to recognize, in, in speaking of Genesis chapter 2, that there is a countercultural truth being given in, in this passage. What constitutes a biblical marriage? What does it mean to be married? How, how is marriage according to God's design? As we see here in Genesis 2, marriage is a sacred and divine institution it's been created by God for His glory, designed by Him, and it is designed by Him to be between one man and one woman. That's it. This is the, the, the teaching of Genesis. This is the teaching of the Old Testament. And this is also the teaching of the New Testament. In the New Testament, things don't change in regards to marriage. It's the, the, the same, one man, one woman. We see this reaffirmed by Christ in Matthew chapter 19, for example. Some people will argue, well, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Jesus never said anything about this subject of, of sexual immorality or that subject, this issue or that issue. Jesus does address it directly. Well, first and foremost, we need to understand that the God who gave us the Old Testament, well, it was a son, right? The, the, the scriptures we have were given by God himself, which includes God the Son. So everything written in the Old Testament is the will of the Son. It is the teaching of Christ. And furthermore, here in the New Testament, Matthew 19, verse 4, the, the context is divorce and remarriage. 
what he says here in verse 4. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. This is the teaching, the direct teaching of Christ in the New Testament. He reaffirms what Genesis 2 says. He quotes Genesis chapter 2. He tells us that marriage is between one man and one woman. And anything outside of those parameters is sin. And brethren, this is an issue that doesn't just have to do with marriage itself. This is not only about marriage. This is not about some tradition that man has held to for thousands of years. This is about something greater. Marriage points to something greater than itself. Marriage is not the end. If you are not married right now, if you are single, let me just tell you, or even if you're married, marriage is not the end. It is merely the means to an end. It is the means to glorify God, and it is the means to accurately represent the gospel. Marriage is about the gospel. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul also quotes Genesis 2. Ephesians 5.31 For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And the context of this passage is Paul giving exhortations to the husbands and the wives. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. In that way you reflect the love of Christ uh, for his church and the church submitting to Christ. We see clearly here that marriage is about the gospel, about the relationship between Christ and his church. The relationship between a man and a woman is about the relationship between Christ and the church. Some people nowadays, some scholars will argue, well, the, you know, the Song of Solomon, that's not about Christ and the church, that's about the love between a man and a woman. Okay, I will grant that. It is, it's about the love of, of, between a man and a woman, but what is the love between a man and a woman about? <laughs> so what is, and I believe that the, the, this, uh, the, the Song of Solomon is pointing to Christ. And I, I don't see it as wrong or erroneous to use the Song of Solomon to talk about the love that Christ has for his bride. Now, of course, we need to be careful not to take every detail, formulate a doctrine out of every detail of the Song of Solomon, but, but it is an allegory of Christ and his bride. That's the way it's been interpreted throughout history. It's ultimately about that. Of course, it, it talks about the love between a man and a woman, and there's much application we can give to marriage and all that. But ultimately, it's about Christ. It points to Christ. Everything is about Christ. Marriage is about Christ. Marriage is a picture. Marriage is a symbol of the relationship between Christ and His church. Marriage points to the gospel. According to God's established order, man leaves father and mother to be joined to his wife. And this word joined in Genesis 2.24 could be translated hold fast to. This word joined or hold fast to uh, is used elsewhere in the Old Testament to speak of covenant faithfulness. Israel had to hold fast to God's word. And other Old Testament passages clearly call marriage a covenant. Man is joined to his wife in this covenant relationship and he's united with her. They become one flesh. They, they form this intimate, emotional, spiritual, even physical covenant bond. 
which is, of course is demonstrated, represented by their sexual intimacy. And this covenant union is a picture of Christ and his church. A man leaves father and mother to be joined to his wife. Christ left his father's heavenly presence to come to earth. A man is called to lay down his life for his bride, as, as we see in the New Testament, like in, in Ephesians 5. Christ laid his, his life down for his bride, the church. Christ is the bridegroom. He comes to redeem his bride. He comes to cleanse her that she may be, be without spot or wrinkle, that she may be holy and without blemish. Then he returns to heaven to prepare a place for her. One day he will come back and he, he will come to consummate, consummate his union with his bride in what is known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. We, his church, will spend eternity in intimate fellowship with our God in the new creation. The last Adam, the last man, is united with the last Eve, so to speak. Brethren, every detail about marriage, from the fact that it's between one man and one wo woman, to their holding fast together in a co covenant bond, to the reality of them being one flesh, to the love that uh, the husband has for his bride, to the submission of the bride to her husband, Everything is pointing to Christ and his relationship to his church. Everything points to the gospel. Therefore, whatever seeks to call itself marriage, but sets itself outside the, of these parameters between one man and one woman in covenant union, is an affront to the gospel. Sexual perversion of any kind, whether heterosexual or homosexual, is an attack on the very gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The perversion of marriage is an attack on the gospel. Brethren, why are we to take seriously the sexual abominations encouraged and promoted by our culture? Because it is a gospel issue. It's a gospel issue. We are not to be lackadaisical, apathetic toward what we're seeing right now, currently in society. Men with men, women with women, rampant fornication everywhere, encouraged everywhere, in the media, in our uh, computer screens, television screens, in our phones, pornography everywhere. The confusion and complete distortion of gender and sexuality, even among children. Pedophilia being increasingly embraced in some circles. Women getting married to their cat. This is, yeah, it's actually going on. And we, we laugh at that, but it's, it's horrendous. We, we laugh at the absurdity of that. But you know what? It's, it's, it's horrendous. It's really happening nowadays. We see the traditional hardening of society, people being hardened, being handed over to a reprobate mind. We see Romans chapter 1 being played out right before our eyes. But you know what? Some Christians, they just shrug their shoulders. They say, well, that's just the world. Sinners will be sinners. What can you do? Oh, sure, we might be horrified by some stories that we hear about on the news. But we simply move on. We live our lives as if this weren't relevant to us. But brethren, do you not realize that this has to do with the very gospel by which we have been saved? This is a gospel issue. Do we have zeal for the gospel? Do you care about what's going on? You, you can try to hide out in your, in your own home, in your own property, and ignore what's going on. But do you really have zeal for the gospel? That's, that's not going to help you. That's not going to help your family. That's not glorifying to God just simply to ignore what's going on. 
That's not glorifying to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are we countering? Are we countering these affronts to the gospel, these attacks on the gospel? Do we have zeal for the gospel? The world has so much zeal. The devil has so much zeal. Cults have so much zeal. Pagans that are promoting these sexual perversions have so much zeal for their false gospels, for their falsehoods. Have, and, 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 uh, often they have more zeal than we do. They have more zeal for their sin than we do for the true gospel, for the truth of God's word. Do we have zeal for the gospel? Do we care? And in saying this, I'm not talking about you know, joining some conservative political group or taking part in some march or, or some, some protest. I'm not referring to going out and holding some signs of God hates, you know what. I'm referring to our zeal for the gospel in, in, primarily in evangelism. How do we counter th these attacks? What are we to do? Are, are, are we to simply be all about these sins? Our society is promoting these sexual perversions and therefore we are going to focus our lives, center our lives around these, countering these sexual perversions. Is that, is that what we are to do? No, that's not what the Bible says. Now, we are to rebuke sin we are to reprove sin we are to compare sin with the word we are to denounce the sins of our society we are to be like John the Baptist in that sense call people to repent we are to denounce the, the proclivities and perversions of our culture but we are not to center our lives around those sins either that's to go to another extreme. We are to focus on the gospel. Why? Because it's the gospel that is the power of God to save. Simply preaching against sin is not going to save. The gospel saves. The gospel is our primary weapon, primary weapon of our warfare that pulls down strongholds, that destroys specula speculations and every lofty opinion that sets itself against the knowledge of God. The gospel takes every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Yes, rebuke sin. Yes, denounce sin. Yes, call sin what it is. Man, be bold about it. But preach the gospel. That should be the emphasis of our message. And we should be zealous for the gospel, but not in a sinful anger not with an animosity toward those people. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Ultimately, we're fighting against the powers that are behind those people, the demonic powers. We are to look at people with pity, with compassion, with love, with grace. We are not to be contentious or bitter. 2 Timothy 2, 24 very good verse that I myself have to remind myself. 2 Timothy 2.24 And a servant of the Lord does not quarrel, does not be contentious, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. We must present the truth in a patient, in a loving, in a gentle way, knowing and trusting that God is able to take that truth and pierce their hearts with that truth and save those people, even if at the moment they are only hostile to us. God can save them. God can take them out of darkness. And we are also to remember what Titus 3 says, Titus 3, uh, Titus 3, 3. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We were once like them. So therefore, let us have compassion. Let us preach the gospel in love and compassion.
not with hatred. And also, one more passage I want to bring to your attention. 1 Corinthians 6. I, I love this passage. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It says here, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, those who have sexual relations of any kind outside of the covenant bond of marriage, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. And by the way, these two phrases translated in, in the New King James as homosexuals and sodomites. The, the first term, uh, malakos, that means soft, effeminate. The second term, uh, arsenikoites, is a reference, it basically means uh, man bed. <laughs> so th these two phrases together, two men in a bed together. One is the passive partner, the other one is the active partner. It couldn't be more clear from this text. It's condemning homosexuality. There is no way around this. So many articles, even books have been written to, to try to convince people that the Bible is not really saying what it says. Homosexuals, sodomites will not inherit the kingdom of God, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But then it says in verse 11, and such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I love that passage because there is hope for the worst fornicator, adulterer, idolater, homosexual, thief, we were among the worst. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were saved. The power of the gospel, God is able to, to save even the most wicked person, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. So we are to know these. How are we to, how are we to counter the perversions of manhood and womanhood in our culture with the gospel and having compassionate love, gentleness toward those who hate the gospel, those who come against the gospel through their perversions, and knowing that God is able to even save the worst of sinners. And we are also to counter the, the, the perversion of manhood and womanhood in our, in our culture by having a zeal for the gospel in our own hearts, in our own families, in our own homes? What are we letting, what are we permitting to come into our minds? What are we watching on television, through movies, on the internet? What are we al allowing ourselves to see? Oh, you can go out and preach the gospel all day, but if you come home and you're there and you, and you just can enjoy a movie with sex scenes, you are, you are working against the very gospel that you were proclaiming. You're finding entertainment in the very sins for which Christ died. And it's even worse if you allow your, your family, your wife, your children to see these things. And I, I know I'm kind of opening a Pandora's box there and we can get into a whole big topic of the Christian liberties and conscience and all that in gray areas, but I'm not talking about that right now. I'm, I'm talking about things that are black and white, clear. This movie has a sex scene in it. Can I, can I watch that? that? That's like watching pornography. In fact, that is pornography. How can you watch that with a clean conscience? Zeal against the gospel also entails having zeal uh, not against the gospel, sorry, for the gospel, against sexual perversion also entails battling, battling this sexual sin in our own hearts and, our, and, and coming against it in our own homes. Psalm 101 says, I will set no, no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. From me. I will know nothing of evil. We are to run from evil. We are to flee fornication, flee youthful lusts not run to it, not see how far I can get to the line. 
how far can I watch? And it's, it'd be not a sin. You don't want to get close to the line. You want to run far from the line. And you don't want to cause your children to stumble. So I, I know I got off on this big tangent here, but I think it's a necessary tangent regarding manhood and womanhood. Countering it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Next week, Lord willing, I will share more about the differences between men and women and why it's important, how we can apply that to our lives. Let's pray.